Um, well, I'm really excited for this next introduction and the next talk. Um, introducing uh, Ashley Pearson, uh, who is going to be talking about the the place in the overall information security cyber lifecycle where threat hunting fits. Really talking specifically from a SOC point of view. Um, Ashley and I had a chance to uh, chat DM back and forth a little bit here uh, before the talk. Came to realize, well, first of all, um, she is a uh, threat hunter with the Air Force down in San Antonio. And came to realize that in each of our non-intersecting Air Force careers, uh, we were both actually assigned at different times to the same small communication squadron in Northern California. Which is kind of cool. So we've got a little bit of ninth com legacy there, which is uh, is very cool. But um, this talk is going to be really relevant for us because a lot of times on the DFIR side, you know, we kind of get these these blinders on and don't really think about that big picture and think about where uh, you know where our work product goes and where our sourcing or our tip comes from, so to speak. And I know Ashley's going to touch a little bit on that. And um, if you give me one more Northern California metaphor uh, from back at Beale Air Force Base, instead of us looking at this down at the, the low in the weeds level where we often are on a daily basis, she's going to bring it back up to the 70,000 feet or higher perspective that, uh, that the U2 would bring in. And uh, I'm really looking forward to that. So that said, uh, welcome, Ashley. We're glad to have you and uh, incredibly excited for your talk. Go ahead. Hey everyone, like Phil just mentioned, uh, my name is Ashley and I work as a threat hunter at the Air Force Commuter, Computer Emergency Response Team. I'm really looking forward today to talking to you guys about uh, the Security Operations Center and where threat hunting fits into that picture. It's something I'm really passionate about. I've ranted enough about it at work, so I figured why not make it into a talk, right? Those always make the best things to talk about. Just to get into it first and a little bit about me so you guys know who I am and where I'm coming from. Like Phil mentioned, I did work at 9th Com at Beale Air Force Base, kind of in the middle of nowhere, Northern California. As a server admin, um, I started my Air Force career eight years ago. And for the first half of it, I was kind of a jack of all trades server admin. I did a little bit of everything. I did ticket jockey work at the help desk. I did server administration, a little bit of vulnerability management and firewall management along the way. And then about halfway through my career, I decided to switch things up a little bit and swap over to what is known in the Air Force as cyber warfare operations, uh, which is mostly cybersecurity. Uh, kind of in a general sense to translate it for you guys. I've worked in a SOC for the last three years. For the last year specifically, I've been a dedicated threat hunter. So I've kind of done a little bit of everything in the Security Operations Center before moving to dedicated threat hunting full time. Um, I do have my Twitter handle up there if you guys want to follow me. I do have a very new blog. It's only got a couple of posts, but I'm hoping it's something to keep up while I keep delving into the cybersecurity realm. I've been super excited because there's so much to learn in cybersecurity. So I've been kind of Pokemon collecting certs there down at the bottom, going to school, taking classes, reading a bunch of white papers, taking as much training as possible. Cause I'm just really excited to learn about all of the things that DFER in general has to offer. So just to go over kind of what I want to talk about today, since I am taking it back up to that 10,000 foot view, uh, the overall question is, how do you integrate threat hunting, which is a relatively new function within a security operations center, with some of the more traditional or pre-established processes or roles, right? So I'm going to start by just going over some of those functions and roles so we're kind of all on the same page since I kind of have to translate from, you know, the military jargon to the more commercial sector stuff. Then I'll kind of go over the culture shift that needs to happen to really make sure that your threat hunting function is going to be successful and that your operations as a whole are going to be successful. I'll go into what threat hunting is, maybe what some threat hunters might look like in your organization so you can identify them a little bit better, how to mature those operations. Um, and then ultimately I'm gonna go over where threat hunting fits into that picture and how you can use that to leverage the abilities that threat hunting can provide to illuminate some security blind spots that you might have in your organization. 
So I'm sure when we think of a traditional SOC, um, we all kind of have a slightly different picture. So I put up here some of the functions that I think of, and I think of these as functions that the SOC performs, right? Instead of tying them specifically to roles, because I'm sure a lot of us work in organizations where just because you're working in a role doesn't mean that's the only thing that you perform. Some people are hat swappers. I think Nicole mentioned that earlier where she wears one hat for half of her day and then she takes it off and wears another one. So I like to think of these more as role agnostic and kind of focus on exactly what the function's providing to you. And I'm sure a lot of us are going to have the same ideas here. Vulnerability assessments are really common. The network security monitoring for a SOC, detection engineering or forensics. And then we get into the analyst tiers here. You know, you have your traditional tier one analyst working the SIEM alerts that come through, uh, tier two being your traditional incident response. And then tier three, if you have it, your SMEs, your advanced incident response, that kind of thing. And I know I mentioned earlier that I moved over to the SOC a couple of years ago. And while I was there, I kind of wandered around for my first, I would say year and a half, kind of bouncing around, trying to figure out exactly where my expertise might fit in and lend its hand to within the organization. Um, so I've spent a lot more time working through the analyst tiers than I have these other secondary positions that uh, perform those functions. And what I noticed while I was working that position is the way that these functions come together to work in your SOC are really going to depend on the people, the processes, and the technology. Those are going to have such a huge impact on what roles you have, who's performing those roles, the tool sets that are available for those functions to really shine in your organization. But then the other thing that I noticed is that a lot of these roles, if you think about them at their core, operate on more of a firefighting level. Uh, you're responding to alerts that are generated in your organization. You're performing these functions in reaction to either your IDS or IPS, your SIEM, or even external agency notifications, which I know are still very common these days. But the thing is, that's not necessarily a bad security posture to have. We just want to try to shift from a more reactive posture to a more proactive one. So if you think of your typical tiered analysts, right, your incident responders, a lot of those guys are going to be performing their function in response to atomic indicators of compromise. And it's going to be very trigger based. Like I said, you have a firewall alert that has fired or a seam alert that comes through that your tier one analyst is going to touch. And it's going to be something that's already known to them. Like this is a known bad file or IP address or domain, and they're going to respond and perform incident response actions to that. Whereas we want to start looking at how to detect activity that's tool agnostic. We want to start looking at indicators of attack. And this is actually something that CrowdStrike has defined that I really like to use when I um, teach new threat hunters that come to the section or talk to even my own bosses in the organization. And these indicators of attack have us focus on detecting the intent of what an attacker is trying to accomplish versus just the tool sets that they use to accomplish these actions on object objectives. You're more concerned with the steps that they're performing within the execution of the cyber kill chain rather than, again, flagging on mimicats.exe or evil.exe, right? And these require no advanced knowledge of indicators of compromise. So you're not sitting around at this point waiting for someone to notify you of something bad happening within your network. You are going out and finding things that are one, very relevant to your own environment and that are happening right now. So instead of taking indicators of compromise and parsing them down to things that might be relevant to your environment, you're really going about it proactively and trying to find these things yourself. And of course, I feel like you can't talk about threat hunting without at some point bringing up David Bianco's Pyramid of Pain. I personally, just to get these concepts in my head, um, I divide the Pyramid of Pain in half. For me, the bottom half of the Pyramid of Pain really deals with and explains those indicators of compromise in a very easy to digest manner. Um, he labels them, you know, domain addresses, IP addresses, hash values, those types of things are very easy for you to implement in your environment when you're looking at detection logic to create. But I also want to spin it around a little bit and think about it from the adversary's perspective as well. 
if you have malicious domain names, IP addresses, and hashes, they're going to be very easy for you to just plug directly into your IDS or IPS or any of your other alerting devices in your, in your environment, right? But they're also very easy for the adversary to change should you alert on them. If you flag a bad domain name, it's very, very easy for them to just swap it over to a new one, register something new. If you pop an IP address, how easy is it for them to just spin up a new cloud instance with a different IP address? It is almost laughably easy for them to change those things too. But once we get over to that proactive side um, and we start focusing on the top half of the pyramid of pain there, it's much more difficult for you to create detection logic around these things, but it's also going to be much harder for them to quickly change to keep evading detection with your environment. And that's exactly why we want to start focusing on the upper half of the pyramid of pain. If you pop a TTP, a tool, or any of the host or network artifacts that they're leaving behind while moving around in your environment, it's going to take them much longer to recover from that detection than it is if you just focus solely on the bottom half of the pyramid of pain here. And I want to make a special note too that transitioning from reactive to proactive can be very slow. It's not going to be a snap of the fingers, all right boys, we're proactive now, this is happening. Sometimes it can be really difficult and it's very easy to fall back into relying on those known indicators of compromise that I talked about before. So sometimes it can be a bit difficult. But what you wanna ask yourself is, so how do we start climbing this pyramid and get away from solely focusing on the indicators compromise and move more towards the top half of the pyramid, right? And the answer is threat hunting. Uh, I realize I'm biased in saying this because I do really enjoy threat hunting, but threat hunting really lives in the top half of that pyramid of pain. They are, as a function, providing internal notification of malicious behavior. They're not just saying, hey, I found mimicats.exe. That's already going to be detected by the IDS or IPS or AV that you have in your environment. They're going out there and finding these things based on the behaviors without, again, without that notification of the malicious behavior happening in your environment. And that's very, very valuable to you. And I know the typical definition of threat hunting that you're going to hear, I'm, a lot of people have touched on it today as well. Uh, threat hunting is really uh, an iterative approach and it's hypothesis driven. So you're saying this malicious behavior is happening in this manner and this is how I'm going to find it and I'm going to prove or disprove that. And that's kind of a widely accepted definition, but there are still a lot of misconceptions. The biggest one being that threat hunting is synonymous with what functions a tier three incident responder can provide to you. That's not necessarily incorrect. Again, it's going to depend on the people processes that you have in your environment that are going to shape this, but they really do provide two different sides of the story to you. Your tier three incident responder is going to be just as smart, just as knowledgeable, but they're still focused on that reactive, like waiting for a trigger to happen before operating. Whereas whoever's fulfilling this threat hunting function is going to Again, go find their own alerts to work. The, sex, the success is just going to be dependent on the culture and personalities that you have fulfilling this function in the long run. So you really wanna make sure that you have the right people fulfilling this function in your organization. And with that comes some expectation management. And this isn't just management's expectation of the people fulfilling the threat hunting function. This really is also the threat hunters having realistic expectations for themselves, right? You're not always going to find bad when you perform a threat hunt and that's okay. And this is very different from some of those traditional SOC functions that we talked about because if you work traditional incident response, you have an alert, you work that from cradle to grave and then you have expected outcomes and things that are gonna come from that. Whereas sometimes these threat hunts just aren't going to be producing things to work from. And that's definitely a hard pill to swallow. And that's probably the hardest part of that culture shift that I talked about, which is why it can sometimes take a little bit longer to implement in the long run. So if everyone could just keep in mind while they're performing this or managing their threat hunters, this quote from Captain Picard, it is possible to commit no mistakes and still lose. That is not weakness, that is life. And this, you really need to take this to heart when you're threat hunting. You can plan for weeks or 
months sometimes the perfect hunt you can analyze all the data sources that you're going to need or what you're going to look for and sometimes you're just not going to find it and that's okay and it shouldn't discourage you in the long run and managers as well it shouldn't discourage you from supporting your threat hunting function because they're not meeting a 100 percent success rate in the long run now if you're meeting if you're never finding anything, that's when you need to go back to the drawing board and make sure that you take the time to learn from some of these mistakes. And that's how we get into how to perform threat hunting. Now, if you look at some of the talks earlier, if you're able to attend them, regardless of organization, MITRE, Target, even Nicole touched on it when she was going through her brief earlier, these are going to vary from organization to organization. Some people have a very, very detailed methodology in the way that they perform threat hunting. But the commonality between all of those things is really four general steps. And this is the squirrel model as well, which is why I like it, because it leaves a lot of room for interpretation. But generally speaking, when you're threat hunting, you're going to start with a hypothesis. Again, you're going to say, hey, I think this activity is happening in this manner, and here's how I'm going to find it. You're going to perform your investigation and either prove or disprove that hypothesis. And then that's eventually going to lead to the discovery of new tactics or uh, activity within your environment. And then it's going to enrich analytics within your environment. And there's a kind of a hidden step here that's inferred from the inform and enrich analytics step, but it's that feedback part of this loop that's really important to focus on. And I really wanna focus on that one for just a minute. The hypothesis generation, the technique discovery, and the patterns and TTPs that you're gonna find are very important, but you're never going to mature your threat hunting operations unless you really take the time to learn from some of the mistakes that you might've made. You need to sit down and ask yourself sometimes some really difficult questions. Did we find this? If yes, can we create detection logic from it? Can we work with the detection engineers here and maybe detect this in the future so we don't have to perform a manual hunt? Did we not find anything? And is that a limitation on skill set or knowledge base? And what can we do to remedy that? Or is this a tool set or a data set limitation? And those are going to be harder to remediate in the long run, but they're still very important questions to ask because your threat hunts are really not going to improve unless you sit down and take recovery time after to ask yourself these questions. And as far as the signatures go, for creating detection logic, sometimes you're going to be able to create detection logic even though you're performing your threat hunts based off of behavioral detection, you're still going to be able to parse out a lot of those indicators of compromise because those are still valuable. You're still going to be able to find the domains and hashes that you can blacklist or whitelist or in your environment. But a lot of this is going to be organization specific and it's still important to recognize like, hey, can we implement this or is this going to have to be manually repeated every, you know, couple weeks or couple months? Again, that's going to depend on the people fulfilling this function. But this is a really, really important step that doesn't get highlighted enough and it's really crucial to improving yourselves in the long run. And that improvement shouldn't just die within the threat hunting section. Your threat hunts really need to start tying into some of the other functions within the organization, right? You can see here in this graphic, you perform a threat hunt and that's going to have incoming intelligence or uh, other sources of information. You're going to generate the hypothesis. You're going to perform the hunt. You're going to perform the investigation. And from that, you're going to get new IOCs, new TTPs, new indicators of attack that can immediately be passed over to your detection engineering function to create and validate new signatures. And then those signatures are immediately going to feed directly into the alerts and incidents that your incident response chain is going to be working. And that's going to lead to more resolved incidents. It's going to improve your detection time in the long run all of those things feed directly into some of the other positions within the security operations center. And even if you're not finding the exact IOCs or indicators of attack that you're working on, you're still going to be able to find sometimes some 
potentially malicious samples of executables or binaries within your environment. Now, if your threat hunters can perform basic analysis, that's fine. And some organizations don't have a dedicated forensics area. But if those malware samples are analyzed or reversed in any way, that's going to generate more indicators compromise. And that whole section of this chart right here is really organization specific immediately. It's not hey, we found this intelligence and this might pertain to our environment, but we're not sure. So we're going to have to do some research. No, this was found in your environment operating. So you know that this is very relevant to your environment and you can cut down on some time between identifying these samples and extracting new IOCs to then feed right back into the incident response chain in the long run. The nice thing about threat hunting is it's not disrupting any of the existing functions within the security operations center. It kind of fits directly before some of them because it's a more proactive approach. So it complements a lot of the things that are already there, which is wonderful. It makes it far easier to implement. Each time you run through the threat hunting maturity or the feedback or feed those threat hunt results into the other areas of your security operations center, you're going to start shrinking the gaps in your detection capabilities. I mentioned earlier that one of the biggest benefits that the threat hunting function provides to you is identifying gaps that you have. They're looking for activity and actors and behavior that have not alerted any of the other detection capabilities you have in the mesh that's created your security enclave. So some of those at the beginning you might find are very big gaps and very scary gaps, but over time if you start taking the things that your threat hunters are telling you to heart and fixing and taking the time to look at that feedback loop and take a look at your environment and say, can we find this? If we can, that's great, but how do we fix it? How do we learn from this? How do we grow as an organization? then you're gonna immediately start improving your security posture and close all of the security gaps that we mentioned. The ultimate goals from shrinking all of these security gaps in the long run is to lower the average dwell time of attackers in your environment. There are a bunch of reports that come out that the dwell time of actors within any environment is astronomically long. It's like a scary number, like days and weeks and months sometimes or years even. You'll see stories come out saying this activity was occurring for years and no one knew about it. And it could have very well been prevented had they implemented a proactive approach to it. So once you start getting after that type of behavior, you're immediately going to start lowering the dwell time of malicious activity in your environment. You're also going to start imposing cost on any of the adversaries. If you start looking at again, the top half of that pyramid of pain from David Bianco, you immediately start tagging and flagging on some of their harder to change indicators of attack, which is going to take them much longer to recover from than if you purely rely on the vendor signatures that are string matching on some of those easier things from the bottom half of the pyramid of pain. And you don't want to make this easy for them. Don't make it easy for adversaries to hide in your network. You want to impose as much cost as possible in the long run on them. Make them change their tools. Make them change the way they behave. Make them so worried that they're going to leave something behind in your environment that you're going to catch that they're not going to be able to hide any longer. That's really the biggest goal from threat hunting is they shouldn't feel safe. You should be operating under the assumed breach mindset where something bad is happening in my environment and I just haven't found it yet. And you want them to also be thinking, they know that I'm here, so I have to be very careful what I'm doing and take longer to complete my actions on objective. And you really want to make sure that they're the ones who are worried and that you're not worried that you just haven't found them yet. So in conclusion, the right people and the right processes can easily make this happen in your organization. Once you get management buy-off and start seeing the value that a proactive mindset can really provide to your organization in the long run, you'll start immediately closing those gaps. And even some of the more difficult things, if it takes a bit longer, that's okay because you're still improving your security posture in the long run. And with that, I leave you with a meme and I ask if anyone has any questions. <laughs>